This is Rob Johnson, President of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with a brilliant young man named Tiger Gao. He's a senior at Princeton. We met a couple of years ago when I was at the board meeting of the Julius Rabinowitz Center at Princeton University, which where I went to graduate school. And he gave an interesting presentation about something called a podcast, which I had that time not done. He runs Policy Punchline out of Princeton and explores all kinds of dimensions from the vantage point of young people who know that this world is still out in front of them. And how would I say, given how Rome have, appears to be burning right now, he's trying to figure <laughs> out what the next fire department's going to look like. Tiger, thanks for joining me today. No, Mr. Johnson, thank you so much for having me. It's obviously a huge honor for me. So when I look at the formation of INET, one of the things you know, we start, we embarked on was engaging the debate with senior scholars and so forth. But we also commissioned a man named Perry Merling and Robert Skidelsky to analyze curriculum, analyze what people are being taught. And this matters very, very deeply because we're not just talking about convincing the experts about what the right models and truth are. We're talking about how the general public that just takes economics 101 or maybe two or three courses come to act as citizens based on their understanding of the role of these market institutions and that. So it's a much, the, the education realm, what I'll call part of the outside game, and we'll talk about inside and outside games over and over today, but the outside game of broad awareness of the role of markets and what goals we've set for society and so forth is just as important as what the insiders believe and particularly in this world, in the aftermath of Donald Trump, where expertise and authority and governance in all the surveys, the trust and the faith in them has disintegrated. And part of what we've got to do is figure out what's wrong. And there's no better place to start than with a creative man <laughs> like yourself that's right in the belly of the beast right now at Princeton. What, and, uh, what, what are you seeing? You'd, you had mentioned to me in the prelude that you'd gone to St. Paul's High School in New England. Yes, Another very I went to a boarding prestigious school. Institute. <laughs> yeah, and then yes. you came to, uh, to, to Princeton. Princeton, and uh, you're, you're, how would I say, uh, engaged in lots of worlds with your own podcast, and that, what, what does it feel like? What does economics feel like? What, where is your curiosity? at this juncture, what, what do you Absolutely. wish was in the curriculum that's not there and what is it that you rejoice that you have learned? Yes, uh, the, the very big uh, questions, <laughs> uh, Mr. Johnson, to, to start us off with. I, I think, um, as you uh, sort of mentioned, I went to a private boarding school and now I'm at Princeton. So the, the past uh, seven, eight years of my life, I've just been very fortunate to, to kind of be at the center of, of world's knowledge, getting the best uh, ed education, uh, but I think part of me also realized in that process that titles don't really matter. It's in, in some way almost feels like uh, hollowing success. I mean, these are very uh, traditionally defined uh, elitist uh, quality education paths, but I didn't find the kind of exciting intellectual fulfillment that I had been looking for. I, I've obviously done very well for myself, but I think in this typical path, I didn't find the intellectual conversations that, that I wanted. So, so I had to largely forge my own path and I, I needed a kind of an entrepreneurial spirit to find and build my own ecosystems rather than relying on others. And that's how Policy Punchline, which is my podcast, uh, came to be. And I, I was a sophomore at Princeton two and a half years ago, and I was very dissatisfied with the, the kind of the extracurricular activities that are being presented here. Uh, you either join a business club or a consulting club or an investment club and, or, or an entrepreneurship club. Uh, but my, my biggest passion back then was to go to talks, afternoon talks, lunch talks, but given by economists, scientists, philosophers. And uh, I realized that very few students go to those talks and very few students go up to those professors or scholars or visitors afterwards to ask them questions and engage with them. So that's when the idea popped into my head, why not start a podcast? And back then it was also kind of a new thing. 
and podcast as a medium, which we can go into later, has this wonderful quality of allowing one to have long form dialogues, long form conversations, uh, during which you really get to develop a connection with, with your interviewee. Uh, and uh, I've just been so fortunate to, to have uh, received so many yeses uh, from the cold emails I sent to. So by this point, over the past two years, we've done more than 120 interviews. Uh, and and uh, uh, ranging from uh, economics uh, to uh, policy to uh, politics to uh, fundamental sciences, energy, all kinds of topics. And I, I guess just to name drop a little bit, uh, maybe in economic policy, we had Austin Goolsby, who was the former White House oh, chair yeah. of Council of Economic Advisors. We had uh, Bill Dudley, former New York Fed president. Uh, in, in, in politics, we had uh, Trey Gowdy, who was uh, <laughs> recently... Uh, we had him very recently for our elections coverage, and he was seen as the as the uh, the head of the Tea Party and, and chair of the mm -hmm. House Oversight Benghazi committees. Uh, Dave Wasserman, uh, who is a very famous election forecaster, um, ranked you know one, top one or two alongside with Nate Silver. Jim Vandehei, who is the CEO of the media company Axios. Uh, in, in in sciences, we had Robert Langer very recently, uh, who, wow. who is an MIT professor and also the the, the co-founder of Moderna and and. Uh, mm -hmm. the most cited engineer in human history. So I, I won't go on with the list, but uh, as you can see, we've just been very fortunate that people w are willing to sit down mm. for an hour, two hours with us to, to talk. And it's just been such an intellectually fulfilling experience to be able to uh, in engage in those types of conversation. And I think it's been life transforming for myself and for a lot of our team members to, to be able to engage in those dialogues uh, in addition to uh, the, the, the classes that we're taking at Princeton. Now that... A uh, curious listener can go to your website. Is it policypunchline.org? Or what, what, what's Pol the. Uh... Yes. Uh, so, so you may find us on policypunchline.com and we are on iTunes, Spotify, com. Stitcher. Yes. Uh, 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 YouTube. If you, if, you go if you Google us, you'll, you'll find us and you can find us on any uh, uh, platform you, you usually go to. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I, I always think about people like yourself, bright people at a place like Princeton. In it, you're, how would I say? Because of your own vitality and intellect, what you've already proven, what you're in the process of creating, there's a lot to be optimistic about. But at this point in time, I'll make a silly metaphor, but it's like being the guy that could do the most push-ups on the deck of the Titanic. Uh, we gotta, we got to save this ship. And the question <laughs> yes. is, are we experiencing too much comfort inside the cocoon of elite institutions? You talked about the kind of clubs everybody's joining. Are we experiencing what you might call brand development in the narrow contours of a highly unequal society to stay in that top tier? Or are we exploring the unsustainability in relation to social issues, climate, et cetera, in a way that allows you to navigate as a leader with a, you might call, heart-filled perspective that might heal this, this very wounded beast called the United States of America. Uh, I guess, Mr. Johnson, part of your question is really uh, asking me whether you, you think the quote-unquote elite education today in a place like Princeton or any other Ivy League institutions, whether it's doing its, its job cultivating the next generation of leaders and what, and what those students are thinking about on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, whenever I talk to professors, they always say, uh, I have hope for, for our society and I'm very optimistic whenever I talk to young people <laughs> because the young people seem to be doing so many exciting things. And, and uh, the cynical part of me and, and pessimistic side of, part of me kind of sees the other other part. I, I would say that mm. a lot of Princeton students around me are dissatisfied with with uh, the kind of uh, culture uh, or, or discourse that is happening on, on campus. They, they, everybody seems to be believing that we are in a somewhat dangerous intellectual thought bubble. Uh, and, and not saying there's anything wrong with it, it's just that uh, obviously there's a tendency that most of us are, are liberal, most of us are progressive, most of us came from a certain background and uh, because people are mimetic, because people um, are, are under certain social pressures or they all take the same kind of classes and read the same news sources, obviously 
it is much you have a tendency for people's opinions to to converge and not just opinions but also ideologies and the way they, they look at the system so whenever i t talk to princeton students and and then i go talk to i guess a, a silicon valley banker or an investor I, I feel like they're in completely different roles and if you go talk to a midwest farmer or someone in the working class uh, you feel like you're also in a completely different shared reality because the silicon valley people are thinking about techno optimism they have their own uh, a set of bubbles per, per se and, and likewise with other people so we seems to be in very different pockets of, of shared realities these days and and uh, we, we can obviously dive in into uh, the, the kinds of thought bubbles in, in uh, elite elite circles or, or education but but I do recognize I think there is some kind of a mindset opportunity cost because um, people people have the direct incentives for young people today a lot of times is is to pursue what is seen to be sexy by other peers right you, you want to start some startup as an entrepreneur be, be on the list of forbes 30 under 30 uh get a great paying job and you're incentivized to do so because um, if you hyper optimize your time at princeton to find a good comforting job you will be able to really achieve that uh, and mm -hmm. and some part of my worry is whether students are actually incentivized to work on the hard problems and and, and tackle uh, complex issues and, and struggles through a lot of things. I mean, it, it's largely a much difficult task for someone to, to, for example, apply to PhD programs and pursue the academic road, route uh, or, or carve out their own path to do something else. Um, so, so I think uh, there is a sense of naivete and, and lack of understanding of the kind of complexities of our world's problems. I, I, I do see how uh, young people have a tendency to, to say it's all the boomers' fault and we just have to do this, 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 and then uh, you know, elect Bernie or whatever, and then the world's problems would be, <laughs> would be solved. And, 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 and I think um, I, I'm, I'm kind of going off all, all kinds of tangents that we can gradually converge here. Uh, but, but I guess uh, uh, the last thing I, I would say... Well, we build, uh, build a mosaic and then we'll organize it after. This <laughs> yeah, is yeah. great. This is great. Uh, I, I think the last thing I would say is, is I probably do see a, a slight decline in quote-unquote elite education in general. Uh, and and, and I, I haven't lived through history for a very long time, so maybe this is maybe I'm idealizing people in the back in the old days. But I, I still remember people telling me back in the 1940s or, or something, uh, the entire class of my high school, St. Paul School, the entire class enlisted in the military to fight the World War II. I mean, th this kind of endeavor is very unthinkable uh, today. It, it, it seems that uh, the 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 students today in those elite institutions are increasingly disconnected. Uh, from from the rest of the uh, the society because of many secular trends, inequality, wealth inequality, technological transformation, not not of their own faults per se. Not that they don't want to get to understand the real world, but but it seems that the disconnect has has widened on, on one hand. On the other hand, it seems that people's critique, I mean, from uh, people like uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb and many other intellectuals, they, they say that elites don't have skin in the game anymore, right? So if you think about a, a typical Ivy League graduate who ended up going to the State Department or work at the Federal Reserve, a lot of times they don't actually have the skin in the game to craft the best kind of policies. Uh, and, and you end up uh, crafting very disastrous policies that you think are, are good for, for society. And, and sometimes I, I recognize that because we, as Princeton students, are very good at justifying whatever we believe in. And sometimes uh, it is very easy for us to think that we are in the right because we're more knowledgeable, we, we, have, we're, we are the most educated, and we see the other side as not uh, worthy to be engaged in or, or that they're simply wrong, where we are morally better. Right? So if you deny climate change, I just won't engage with you. If you don't agree with this movement or, or, or th this kind of perspective, it must be that you're ignorant or that you read misinformation. And I certainly don't do that because I am at Princeton. That, that seems to be a somewhat prevalent case, but, but you see a great cognitive dissonance in some way because people say those things, students say those things, uh, but, but again, as I previously said, the immediate incentive is not for them to actually work on hard problems, so they end up really thinking about big issues and trying to tackle complex issues, but they don't actually end up doing so. Uh, n not of their fault of their own, per se, but, but I do think there, there is some kind of sense that, that the elite education is in decline today for, for many reasons. Uh, but but I've, I've really rambled on a, a while, so. <laughs> well, no, this, this is important because, you know, you know I've done a lot of work with Michael Sandel in uh, his most recent book, The Tyranny of Merit, 
gets at some of these issues, the issues between what you might call education versus credentializing and what is going on inside the schools. Secondly, the despair of those other people who don't have the elite pedigree and their trust in elites, their view, the, what you might call the healthy romantic view was one gets an education develops great gifts or skills, cultivates your gifts in lateral pattern recognition, become aware of more facets and aspects of society. And then in, a, in an elite role in governance, one can uh, be more sensitive and help the design evolve. And that's a noble calling. On the other side is viewed like after the Vietnam War, David Halberstam, the best and the brightest. These guys made a huge mistake with Vietnam and they justified it and justified it and spent billions and billions of dollars at that time, which would be trillions now. Did a lot of harm to people psychologically and everything else, killed a lot of people. I mean, Martin Luther King towards the end of his life, one year to the day before he died, gave a speech at Riverside Church called Beyond Vietnam, a time to break the silence. And so you have different phases in different periods, but I think we're in one right now as you, I don't know whether it's the decline of education or the decline outward in the faith in elites that that education is being used for public purpose as opposed to what I'll call private credentialization, material gain and other things. But it's a very, very challenging time. And, you know, I'm a, a white male who went to MIT in Princeton, worked in the financial sector. I can be accused by people on the outside frequently of being part of that elite circle. I try to hear that criticism, but if it hurts, kind of a natural, what I'll call brain science reaction is to be self-protective. When people try yes. to shame you, you become more self-protective. It's hard to open up when people are throwing flames at you. And yes. you're in an earlier phase, but just what you might call those credentials in one corner of the room are celebrated, and down the street, they're burning a scarecrow with your name on it. And uh, I, it's just a hard, it's a very hard time. And yes. I guess the question is, what got you to reach outside of your academic realm, explore the podcast, explore other forms of media? You've talked to me about Substack. You've talked to me yeah. about this new one, Clubhouse. Yes. Various ways of augmenting your awareness and your insights and, what, and defining what matters. Tell me, tell me a little bit, like where, when did you, what was the seed of your decision to form a podcast and then explore these other realms? Yes, P perhaps one uh, detail I didn't <coughs> mention at the beginning when I was talking about, it, it, it seemed like I was just going on a rant about my, my peers, but I, I, I wasn't trying to, but I, I guess one issue I, I found, and I'm, I, I'm quite skeptical myself about my own learning is that, uh, it's, it's very hard for me to know uh, whether the beliefs I have are the quote-unquote right, right set of beliefs. So, so for example, um, during, uh, during all the turmoil that, ha that has happened over, over the past year, uh, a lot of my friends took actions, they, 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 they want to do something good, and they post Instagram stories or they forward articles uh, and, and then try to s spread positive causes. And I think that's all good, but, but in some way, these are also simple statistics, a lot of times naive empiricisms. A lot of these sources of information that we have uh, uh, are not conducive to actually understanding the matter in, in a primary source based uh, original way. Right? It's, in other words, it's, it's very hard to read New York Times and really explore the truth. It's kind of a survey of, of the kinds of opinions out there, but a lot of those uh, articles or reports are certainly narrative driven. They, they, they have all kinds of their own biases. Maybe they're not written by experts. Uh, so part of my own dissatisfaction was that I wasn't sure whether the beliefs that I held, uh, whether, whether the sources of information I had were correct. And, and I think 
podcasting was the best way to, that I could think about. And, and I would even say probably the last line of defense in today's media landscape uh, to, to really explore that. I mean, I, mean I, I guess maybe we can talk a little bit more about what, what attracts me so much about podcasts. I mean, technically, on, from a technical aspect, it, it's open protocol. It's like an email or a blog. You, you just put the podcast on the RSS feed. Any app can, can receive that feed, so it's not really published onto a specific platform or a system. It's not censored or controlled by any aggregator like Instagram. So, so the platforms can't really censor it, and, and you have this flourishment of, of ideas. That's why we have podcasts about anything. And it's very easy to set up. Anybody can do this. Uh, and, and it's such a huge contrast to the common information delivery system these days because the common information delivery system these days are all short and sweet, the mainstream news, social media, Twitter. Uh, and, and these are very easy to paint disingenuous representations of people's arguments, right? When you are trying to reduce Dr. Fauci's arguments into a two-minute clip, of course people are going to find conflicting clips of, of two minutes and, and then contradict him. But, but a lot of times it's not what he's saying. The, the, the nuanced arguments are much more complex. So, so it, it made me realize that it's very easy to package narratives into something short and sweet. But in long form discussions, you can really sniff out, sniff out uh, the BS, right? So uh, by, by prodding it, by questioning it, but by challenging our guests, I can actually explore the issue and it allows me to see their logical processes and fallacies uh, because it's much easier to BS for five minutes than for three hours. And if I can have a two hour conversation with someone, I can really explore uh, the, the issue. And, and I think that goes back to my journey doing Policy Punchline and what, what our mission is. We're, we're not narrative driven, or at least we, we try not to be. We, we don't have a predefined view. I mean, we're, we're not liberal or conservative. We're not partisan. Uh, we don't try to uh, interview people of a certain political spectrum. We actually, I mean, j just to give you an example, during this election season, we interviewed someone like David Pakman, who is a very famous, you know, leftist YouTube influencer. And we also interviewed someone like Robert Barnes, who is, uh, proclaims himself to be a constitutional populist and is the lawyer for Alex Jones and the Covington mm -hmm. kids. So, so we try to explore those issues very broadly and widely, and, and we don't have a predefined narrative uh, and, and hopefully, I mean, and by the way, I would say a lot of podcasts out there do have a predefined narrative that they're trying to uh, propagandize or, or, or spread to people. And, and, we, we, and we try to be as truth-seeking as possible. Uh, and, and, and I guess my concluding thought is, is, is our, our cultural, social, and political discourse these days seem to be very fragile. And, and we can talk about this fragility later. Uh, it, it seems to me that because you have dramatically reduced people's attention spans, because social media has made uh, the, the, the profit structure to be fundamentally about clickbaity or, or, or reducing them to sound bites, uh, likewise with legacy media, that, uh, the, the fundamental business model of the traditional information delivery infrastructure was not aligned uh, w w with what is in the best interest of people's knowledge formation. Uh, and I think podcasting is in some way the last line of defense. I mean, usually books would do that in terms of giving you some long-form content, but, but books don't comment on day-to-day -day news activities and, and, and current events. So, so the, kind of the best way for me to learn these days is just to listen to podcasts. Uh, and, and I think I, hopefully you and I can also experience this today, which is podcasting is not really about me preaching a certain ideal, but rather we can come to a neut mutual understanding of truth uh, or, or, or some approximation of, of what we see to be truth. Yeah. Uh, and, and that is what I see as, as the beauty of podcasts and what incentivize me to, to really do it is this inner questioning uh, of whether the stuff I am believing in, the, the stuff that so many people around me believe in or whether they are actually correct. And, and perhaps I will eventually re uh, reach the same conclusion, but I think the process of you reaching that same conclusion uh, uh, should be much more complex than reading it off of an Instagram post or a Facebook article. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you had mentioned to me in our uh, preparatory conversations that you had been very uh, influenced by a group that they refer to as the intellectual dark web. And obviously one of the maestros in the podcasting world, Joe Rogan, has <laughs> yeah. also been a, a big influence. But describe how did they get under your skin? What, what did you learn from exploring the terrain that they cover. Sam yes. Harris, Eric Weinstein, who's 
wife, yeah. Milani, works with me at INET running our San Francisco operation and various yeah. others, Jordan Peterson and others. What, yeah. what, what did that bring to the table for you? Yes. Um, I, I would say if there's any quote unquote narrative that the policy punchline where myself is, is really trying to convey sometimes is that we are counter narrative is that we see what is happening in the media landscape these days. And then we ask the question, uh, why is this happening? Why are people talking about this? Uh, why do people suddenly all believe in this? And, and how can I refine my understanding about that and, and examine that from a somewhat external perspective? And, and I think that's what you know, the quote unquote intellectual dark web has done in the past couple of years, which is, which is that they saw the legacy media, they saw uh, the, the political discourse and debates between the, the dichotomy of uh, Democrats versus Republicans. They saw all of this and they re really don't like it. And, and, and they're not right wing per se, even though some of them might have a slightly conservative bent uh, or, or libertarian bent. Uh, but, but it seems that th there's this kind of uh, reactionary sort of we don't like what is currently being preached to us type of uh, mm -hmm. underlying mm -hmm. current. In, in this movement. And it is, so I, I've been following a lot of those long form podcasting and th these people are sort of the best long form podcasters out there. As, as you mentioned, Joe Rogan, uh, Eric Weinstein, Sam Harris. Uh, I, I would probably over, even add uh, Lex Friedman, who, who probably does something more science related, but uh, he is also engaging more in the, in the cultural discourse these days. Uh, and, and, and these people, it's very interesting. I don't agree with everything they say, and I think it's it's been uh, my I, I, my thoughts on a lot of those issues shift back and forth. But because they do those podcasts the last four hours every time, you know, like what Eric Weinstein does, it, it's just been a very interesting experience uh, to to listen through their logical and thought processes and, and see this cultural phenomenon in, in today's uh, media media landscape. I would say. Yeah. Well, I uh, in recent days had listened to a Sam Harris podcast. Uh, it's called The Divided Mind, and it's about a, a writer and a book, a man named Ian McGilchrist, and his book is called The Master and the Emissary, and it's about left versus right brain process, and that in many ways the master is the right brain in his way of seeing things. Uh, Canadian broadcasting company, CBC, made a beautiful documentary about it, and Ian and, uh, and Sam explored for a couple of hours. And uh, I had read the Gilchrist book uh, maybe two years ago. A gentleman named Lawrence Freeman, who's a Benedictine monk and uh, teaches meditation, told me he thought I would be interested. I thought the book was fascinating. But to see it on that podcast, it, it sort of validates your perspective about where you might call some of the deep dives and curiosity that that group is able to uh, bring to the table in this new format we call the podcast and, uh, and, and I, I, I enjoyed yeah. it tremendously yeah. and, and by uh, the way I, I i i was listening to uh, sam harris it was really interesting that he was saying uh please stop calling me that i'm part of the intellectual dark web <laughs> i i think yeah. at one point because because he was saying that uh he 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 is his, himself, and, and he does not like to be sort of grouped under one big structure and be critiqued under yeah. one big structure. And he was not happy to see some members of the intellectual dark web uh, taking Trump's uh, lawsuits, uh, election lawsuits, more seriously than th th they deserve to be. And, and he was quite yeah. unhappy. So, so I think Sam Harris probably also stands in, in this part, which is he doesn't like the political correctness. He doesn't like what he's seeing with right. New York Times or the legacy media or the Democratic Party. But he's saying, but wait a second, it's not like I, I'm pro-Trump or pro-Republican yeah. Party. I mean, there are probably well, even worse not, things on the right side. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, He's not an advocate. He's an explorer. And that's quite exactly. healthy, I think. And I yes. watched uh, or I listened to his podcast after the January 6th episode in the Capitol. And he had lots yeah. of criticisms for all sides about what was happening and who was using it for other agendas as, yes. uh, that he didn't think was accurate. It was really quite a, quite an extraordinary episode and a courageous episode. I, had, I admired how, what you might call, he stepped out in front of the speeding truck on both left and right sides of those arguments. Uh, yeah. And uh, I found it refreshing. And uh, what, uh, Not, 
Yeah. What other things do you uh, find as inspiration? Some people are interested in poetry. Others are interested in, you know, deep dives in psychology. People like Jonathan Haidt. Uh, yeah. And his most recent book, The Coddling of the American Mind, about the influence of some of these coercive tactics. Tristan Harris and others made a film about, uh, how do we call it, the social dilemma. Social dilemma, yeah. On, on how the electronic technology is affecting us. And as was said towards the end, how it's fomenting a civil war because to keep their advertising budget, everybody's getting positive reinforcement for their priors and it's bifurcating yes. society into two vehement teams. So there, there's a lot of stimulus out there. And I'm just curious, what have been some of the the high points? What would you put in your, your hall of fame of the things that have changed <laughs> your perception here in the last two to three years? Uh I, I would say uh, podcasting is probably the, the most significant because that's also where I derive uh, a lot of my day-to-day -day information I, from, from all those thinkers. So uh, honestly, some of the people we, we've listed before, along with other podcasters, sort of more uh, traditional like Ezra Klein, a, a lot of those people influence my thinking in many ways. Uh, outside of podcasting, I would say, which we can go into a little bit later, is, is my only experienced uh, interaction with economics. I'm fascinated by the subject. I'm an economics major. I, I love the field and economic debates. I read uh, dozens of economics books every year. That I, I, I really love the kind of debates that are happening in financial markets, in economics, mm -hmm. academia. And I personally uh, struggled a lot in the past year or two uh, thinking whether I should apply for economics PhD programs. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and last fall, mm -hmm. I, I went through a very long process applying to uh, research positions uh, and, and grad school uh, and, and I ended up coming out of it, deciding not to do it, and, and, and which, which is a big formative experience on, on that end. Uh, and, and I think on, that, on the other hand, I think my interactions with my peers really shaped me a lot. I mean, especially given all the social turmoil, uh, COVID, Black Lives Matter, and then election season. I mean, the past year in 2020 uh, shaped me in, in such a profound way because you see how uh, thoughts start to diverge. Uh, students have become more politically activated. And, and, and their thoughts diverge. And as you clash with people and debate with people, uh, you, you also become more mature. You also derive a lot of uh, intellectual fulfillment out of those connections and debates. And, and, and it's fascinating to see um, how, how Princeton students and, and my friends from other institutions um, come out of those processes uh, critiquing the world, critiquing things. And, and I think that, that gave me a, a, a huge boost as well. And, and also, I guess the last thing I would touch on which is something we talked about last time we saw each other in person is meditation and, and, and yoga and uh, that side of things. I mean, I, I spent three year, three, three months, three weeks, actually, I, I keep <laughs> screwing up the scale. Uh, I, I spent three weeks in India last winter, the winter before COVID hit. Uh, and, mm. and I was on this yoga meditation trip that Princeton uh, took us on. Uh, and, and I had a sort of a great philosophical and spiritual experience uh, interacting with some of the monks there and, and learning uh, stuff about Hinduism and also uh, practicing meditation myself. So, so I think that that part of uh, component also shaped me a, a decent amount. So, th these were probably the some of the major influences that would come to my mind. Uh, yes, that's fascinating. Yeah. That's that's <laughs> amazing. The uh, people in India, all, all of the Sri Ramana Mar yeah. Marishi, <laughs> and uh, there's a gentleman. He wrote a book. He's a French thinker. He wrote a book called Sat Chit Ananda. And he was trying to reconcile the monotheism of his training as a French Catholic clergyman with the polytheistic vision of gods and try to understand how to, how to, how do they say, Fuse them so that it wasn't one was right, the other was wrong. There, are, there's a lot of, a lot of, a lot to explore there, and a lot to explore. I remember yes. when the uh, I read a book recently called "The Gospel According to the Beatles," and it was yes. about how the Beatles were kids, like working class kids in Liverpool, and as they started to catch fire, what they refer to as Beatlemania was almost like religious devotion. 
like they were witch doctors or shamans or something. And the fascinating thing was that the Beatles didn't understand where this was coming from. So they went exploring. George Harrison and John Lennon were more at the vanguard of that. Ringo went along because he was a good fellow and Paul McCartney was a bit the anchor. But they ended up all four in India for an extended period of time. Uh, they explored the use of psychedelic drugs and other things to try to understand where did all this energy come from? And uh, it's, it's really, it's fascinating to see how those Eastern philosophical disciplines have influenced the culture of the United States. There was an Englishman named Alan Watts who was a uh, London-born, I think, or, or English-born, London-based for a while, who moved to Northern California, dealt with all the beat poets, and became an interpreter of Eastern philosophy and Zen Buddhism and what have you, uh, and was very influential in particularly Northern California when you had that, that counterculture 60s uh, before it became called what I'll call New Age and, uh, and seemingly uh, engaged in political reform. It was at the time people like Jack Kerouac were writing and others. And it, it's fascinating to me to hear that you had the, what you might call, inclination, the intuition to go explore in that realm at this juncture. I find that encouraging. <laughs> Uh, I, I would say it's probably because uh, I consume too much media. <laughs> these, these I'm very uh, deeply ingrained in the in the discourse today. Uh, there's so much information and and stuff uh, flowing through my brain every day. As as we uh, talked about right before the interview, people are going crazy these days, and they're trying to put out the fire in their brain. Yeah, so so we're seeing right. this rise of meditation and, and so on. And, and and obviously, I think being at Princeton was has always been a very high stress environment. Uh, I'm always uh, doing research, taking classes, uh, running the podcast, uh, and, you know, just, just so much going on. And, and there's constantly more, more s stimulants coming in uh, from all sides in, in mm -hmm. terms of I political ideologies or new, new economic ideas. Uh, and, and, and sometimes I, I do find myself uh, feeling the need to calm down, so. Yeah, well, when we uh, started INET, back in 2010, April, there was a gentleman who had been a friend of mine who'd been an Italian economic and finance minister named Tommaso Padiaschioppa. And he gave the last talk at the first conference in Cambridge, England. And he said, I think that INET has to focus on three things, Financial sustainability, and that's what this crisis has brought to a head, meaning the great financial crisis of 2008-9. Second, resource sustainability, and it relates to climate issues and rapport with the environment and with Mother Nature. And then the third was what he called social sustainability. And then he finished his speech and he sat down. By the way, he later wrote it up as one of the Pierre Jacobson lectures that you can find online uh, just before he passed away. But it's about two months after he gave this speech at INET, he, he put it in writing so that our listeners and your friends can, can, I'll send you a copy. But he was talking about how the, breakdown in finance, given the prestige of finance, was going to rattle people, was going to take people to a place of great uh, discord, and the trust between government and markets would come under pressure. And then he, he, when he sat down, he said, I didn't say this on stage, Robert, but all of this is gonna feed back into social unsustainability. And when I listened to you just moments ago talking about your trip to India, what I could sense was a prescience, like you were a seer, because you went there before the pandemic. 
It wasn't after yes. we're all in isolation and, and like you said, our brains were burning. Yeah. You, you, you could see it coming. You could sense it coming. I won't say see it, but sense it. And yeah. I think that's fascinating. I think uh, I, I, I'm, I admire your humility and your curiosity at the same time. I think that's a really uh, a nice combination. That, uh, so we're, we're uh, I guess, I, we could kind of, you run a podcast. How can I yes. uh, share with you like you share with me? What, what would you like I, to I, explore? I, I guess the, the first topic I would, I would love to, to ask you about is uh, how, how INET is changing or trying to challenge some of the orthodoxies of economics, economics, academia, economics, policy making, financial markets. What do you see as some of the main problems and challenges in mm -hmm. these fields? And how do you think INET is trying to push through to change it? Okay. Well, I guess there's uh, different categories of embedded within your question. One is where are the places that affect society where economics may be misleading and doing the most damage. In other words, where are the fights worth having? Secondly is uh, if you're engaged in persuasion or reform, how do you approach that? And how has that changed in recent years? And so I guess where we started with INET with the great financial crisis, and I had worked with the Senate Banking Committee, and I had worked with uh, Soros Fund Management, more capital, and both in hedge fund world, was the sense that the deregulated finance where government got in the way and the markets could take care of themselves until they didn't and blew themselves up created a crisis, a crisis of legitimacy, of governance, of expertise, of academic finance. And as you know, George Soros had written a book going back in 1987 called The Alchemy of Finance. He was a student of Karl Popper. He believed in radical uncertainty that and Frank Knight or John I, Maynard right Keynes talked about. Yes. And... Uh, Myself, I had become an economist under the tutelage of a man named Charles Kindleberger, who wrote a book in the years when I was his student and his research assistant called Manias, Panics, and Crashes. So I guess I was well seated to someday meet George Soros because there was a sym sympathetic psychological uh, you know, vision of the financial market process. But I think that great financial crisis, many people thought it was going to be just uh, like, okay, you guys are going to go put that back together and then we'll be back on the tracks and everything will be fine. But as we saw after the bailouts and the rise of the uh, Occupy movement on the left, the Tea Party on the right, that loss of faith in government, loss in faith or notion of corruption, as Joe Stiglitz said, the polluters got paid. Uh, the people who made the mess are the people who got bailed out. You could start to see pressure. Even people, wise, former Princeton, uh, Princeton graduate, Paul Volcker, would say to me in private conversations, we are not in a place where central bank independence is going to continue to be tolerated because Wall Street created a crisis. We bailed them out. Probably the right thing to do as opposed to going over the cliff into a depression, for sure. But we're not buying state and municipal bonds so that schools and infrastructure and hospitals and localities can function when they're in a depression that was caused by a Wall Street recklessness. And people are going to start, you know, like Ron Paul and others, protesting Fed's independence is that allows them to be taking care of the financial sector and not society as a whole. So you could see all of this evolving. Around that time, 
the work that Tony Atkinson, Tom Piketty did upon top income and wealth databases, part of which INET helped to fund. Joe Stiglitz's book, The Price of Inequality. The questions of social sustainability, as Tommaso Pariosquilper predicted, started to raise their head. And then the very, very long-term concerns about political economy related to climate change, the fossil fuel industry, why we weren't evolving in a constructive environmental direction when the science was so strong. What, uh, what uh, scholars like Naomi Oreskes wrote about, the merchants of doubt, the people who tried to sow the seeds of the notion using the same playbook that the PR men for the makers of cigarettes did about health or not from tobacco. They used that vis-a-vis -vis climate to try to pretend climate was a hoax. It was a left-wing conspiracy or whatever. And, and you could see all of these things kind of just rushing up onto the stage together. And I, my own view was that the election of Donald Trump in 2016 was a symptom of the despair, the symptom of the awareness that things were starting to rage out of control on a lot of different frontiers. What, what's happened with INET in that context is that in the beginning, we spent a lot of time at Harvard, Princeton, Berkeley, Oxford, Cambridge. And, and I'll, I'll say this, my father had an old saying. He said, if you let people think you're a dragon, then you're a dragon. But if they think you're a dragon, go meet them and they'll realize you're a human. And my dad was a physician, but he was involved in medical politics and he used to use that adage all the time. So I thought, I don't have any animus towards economists at prestigious institutions. But if we go there and we, we foment critical discourse and try to help open the debate with them, with their participation, maybe being slightly more inclusive of people like Post Gainesy and others, we can start to evolve to a less rigid consensus than the world of rational expectations and free market ideology that seem to be in the way of thinking about things like climate change and social sustainability. But I think what happened is the pace of disintegration and fear went much faster than many people expected or, or hoped would be the case. And so the influence of elite brand name institutions was demonized by the people like Marie Le Pen, the AFD in Germany, the pro-Brexit crowd, and Donald Trump and his cohort. And so you sense that uh, this, uh, and then I guess in parallel with that was going from traditional media where the influencers, the op-ed pages, the network television, the leading cable television were the conduits to people and out into the world of social media. I remember once the famous New York Times reporter Tom Friedman and I had been in a working group and he said, the only way I can keep my sanity is to not look at all the comments on Twitter about my column. I have to go inward yeah. and not be bombarded yes. by hate mail and shaken to my roots. And I thought that was a beautiful and a humble way of, of expressing it. But the, but the idea that Walter Cronkite, the New York Times, and three Ivy League professors at Harvard, Yale, and Princeton decide what America's going to do just wasn't the model anymore. And so... I guess what I would say now is that at INET, we want to foment critical discourse, not saying we have a policy, but saying let's debate the full spectrum of the policy so that people learn, they enlarge their imagination. One of the mentors of my undergraduate career was an international economist named Rudy Dornbush, who's from He's no longer alive, 
But Rudy once said to me when he was consulting for the hedge fund industry, he said, you were my student. Why do you guys get paid so much and we don't get paid? And I said, Rudy, your job, and you do it beautifully, is to expand the imagination. And our job is to pick the right model. <laughs> and I don't know why they pay one more than the other because both are valuable. But he, he got a good laugh out of that, so did I. It was, but, but, yeah. it, but the expansion of the imagination, multidisciplinary activity and so forth, I think is people like the MacArthur Foundation. When I was starting INET, put together multidisciplinary research groups and everybody, economists, sociologists, anthropologists, political scientists, historians, all felt they learned more because of the respect of the people that weren't in their tribe that they developed because they're quality minds in all of these disciplines. But as the outside game of social media, as you might call the signal to noise ratio deterioration took place as the loss of trust in elite institutions, I think that INET has moved in directions which have to respect that change in the channels of influence, but it's also moved in the direction of thinking what is important is not just influencing the research leaders or the peer review journals, which we've done a lot of work in analyzing how they constrict issue space or have crony cabals, etc. But people like James Heckman and Angus Deaton and George Akerlof had done really serious work about these these challenges of the, the, the peer review the journals. Yes. And, the, and you know, they influence tenure. They influence research assessment exercises in many countries. They'll pick a guy who's widely published before they'll pick a guy whose proposal is interesting because some people are like in a tenure decision. If you say no to tenure and you're a dean, you're, you might get sued. How do you defend yourself? If you're a research allocator for the government and you fund a controversial project, how do you defend yourself? And they were using the scorecard card of peer review journal as a, what I call indicator or litmus test of who is deserving of research funding. So it's a very powerful mechanism. But I think to come back to it at, at this juncture, moving upstream towards the realm where we started this conversation, what's in the curriculum? What's the education? What's the difference between tests and credentials in your major and the broad array of things? How can INET create what I will call a repository of alternative thinking that's not just taking a bite out of an Ivy League agenda. It's fomenting a broader critical discourse and making it free. Then a student like yourself, put it in a metaphor, your head is not in a cage. You don't have to pay for it. There are things to explore that you may disagree with, but they tweak your imagination. And I think moving towards that realm also is doing something which is not playing an inside game with experts, but recognizing the outside game of the broad political participation of citizens at elite schools and other schools who can become more sensitive, more sophisticated, more curious, and more vital as citizens in contributing to a democracy in which market capitalism is embedded and at times may need to be constrained. So there are a lot of facets to it. It's, it's a very uh, fluid thing, and I think it requires a lot of humility uh, in the sense that it's not, I, I think you could get depressed about not being persuasive in many instances. <laughs> I think it's a glacial process yeah. rather than an aha kind of. Yes. Thing, but but it, there, there are many fronts associated with the challenge. And there's a changing structure of society and what's viewed as legitimacy, and they all, they all influence strategy on the fly. Uh, Mr. Johnson, I guess to very quickly recap, 
I mean, all, all, it was very dense, your, your answer. And, and uh, you, you first brought up some of the large macro financial trends that, that we witnessed. And, and I have to yeah. bring up my own thesis, thesis advisor, Professor Atif Mian. Yeah, I know him well. He's of the, he's of, a of the brilliant guy. Ha Center. House of yes. Debt that he and uh, House Professor of Sufi exactly. in Chicago did is a wonderful book. He, he's one of the, one of the foremost uh, financial economists of our age, and he was obviously ex explaining to us. Uh, he was trying to link inequality, credit, um, the, the, the the fall of interest rates, asset prices, productivity growth, all of those things together and, and, and mm -hmm. analyzing those secular trends. And, and so that was one part, the, the macro financial issues and, and how a lot of the experts and market participants before 2008 were unable to, to, to imagine the unknowns, as you were saying. Yeah. So, so that was the, well, for the instance, second part. The bailouts yeah. instead of mortgage reductions and recapitalization yes. of the banks and right uh, down uh, to the their bank. bondholders had huge distributional and fiscal implications. Yes. But but yes. the world the world didn't have that all on deck and in a consciousness yes. of like these are on the menu. Ex post yes. he Ex -post. and Supi explored and articulated yeah. beautifully what might have happened. But Absolutely. wasn't necessarily in the middle of a crisis where anybody had the confidence to do those things. Right. And, and, and the second part that, that you were bringing up, I, I guess, is what I would say is the fragility of the expert class in, in today's age somehow, because there, there are many explanations of this. Some people say it's because the experts weren't so good, and there are people who say it's because the media landscape has you know, shortened everybody's attention span and the experts feel obli obligated to adjust to today's media landscape, which inherently mm -hmm. reduces the quality of their arguments. Right? You have to reduce... Uh, my, my current professor, uh, Christopher Sims, who is uh, a Nobel laureate many years ago, yes. and, and when yes. I take his class, I mean, his way of thinking as, as a Bayesian, how he thinks about probability, how he updates his beliefs under uncertainty in today's age, how he thinks about hypothesis testing for, for COVID and why vaccines should, should work. And, and I mean, it's brilliant, but, but the common people do not hear this. If you look at Twitter, you look at all the shouting matches between academics, and if you go on CNN, you feel like the economists do not know what they're talking about. And, and, and so, so, so I guess mm -hmm. the, the fragility of the expert class because of all those societal forces is another thing that you, you mentioned. And the third thing is something very quite close to my heart, which is the, the tyranny of the big journals. I, I have personally n not gone through the, the publishing process myself. I'm just an undergrad. Yeah. Uh, but, but around me, so many graduate students tell me horror stories. Uh, and, and we see Twitter threads very recently. There, there, there was a very famous Twitter thread just a couple of days ago uh, accusing some MIT Nobel laureates for, for abusing their power uh, mm. and for threatening um, people. And it seems that everybody outside of the top schools have some horror story to tell uh, about the bad culture in top schools and how people in top schools abuse them. And, and uh, yeah, so, so which is, which is uh, lets you think about the irreality of academia and how... Uh, P academics might be even more political than the corporate sector and they might be fighting each other for, for they might be incentivized to, to, to really fight for uh, re rewards, reputations and, and prestige in a, in a different way, in a, in a different battle. Yeah. Well, um, one, one has to be what you might call an institutional economist to study this context because at one level, the idealized or romantic notion of the intellectual professor is someone who is independent curious, has a brilliant sensitivity and skills to render, whether writing or mathematics or what have you. And so they are producing for the public good. There is another sense, which is beautifully articulated in a 1922 article by the muckraker and gadfly, H.L. Mencken. The name of the article is The Dismal Science where he says the only people I trust less than theologians are economists because they understand the structure of power. They understand what promotion, they understand what angers the trustees or the development department. They understand what would stop them from getting a government position of prestige, like a member of the Federal Reserve Board or Federal Trade Commission or something like that. They understand what the media won't publish because they're advertisers would be furious if they carried, so that in essence, and this is a beautiful uh, 
comment I got from one of my board members, Jillian Tett, who works, she's a cultural anthropologist. She works at the FT. I asked her yes. over a lunch at the onset of INET, I said, Jillian, give me some advice. She said, Robert, <laughs> study the silences, because what not said will tell you where the power is in society. And I thought that was a fascinating notion. Was, But so in some level, like I said, the romantic open discourse where everything is these free, fair-minded, brilliant people exploring is overlaid with all the incentives and the forces, which are now called the sociology and anthropology of the profession and that surrounds the profession, the context in which it's embedded. And that makes for a very uh, different interpretation. And the cynic on the outside says the expert is a tool. What John Ralston Saul, the famous Canadian philosopher in his book, Voltaire's Bastards, calls the rational courtesan. They're in the king's court. They're serving power. They're not describing truth or the spectrum of possibilities. And so I, I think there, there are lots of uh, people who might be, which I might say, too paranoid or too suspicious. But when the social system isn't working right, it fuels through the emotion of fear, those suspicions and expertise goes on trial. Uh, Mr. Johnson, I guess just to quickly follow up, and, and perhaps this is something I'd love to hear your thoughts on, uh, which is that people outside of academia are sometimes very skeptical of what people in academia are studying. Uh, they, they think a lot of the times academia is ultimately not impact driven. They're ultimately incentivized by their own intellectual gratification. You, you, you need your research to convince three people around you or the referees at journals in order to publish and you make whether marginal or non-marginal improvements of certain literatures, but, but you are incentivized to make theoretical, you're, you're, you're turned on by the theoretical challenges rather than seeing whether your, your, your research impacts people. And, and a lot of practitioners, whether in financial markets, certainly in financial markets, they're very skeptical of financial economists, but mm -hmm. e mm -hmm. even, in, even in policymaking, because I, I recently uh, spoke with a, a, a former Indian high-level uh, policymaker who was on our show, and, and he was advising Modi, and, and he was saying how a lot of the research done by uh, Esther Duflo and, and Abhijit Banerjee, you know, the, the Nobel, very mm -hmm. recent Nobel laureates from 2020, right. randomized control trials, j Powell, poverty reduction, he said it almost had no impact on economic policy. I mean, it, it, because mm -hmm. you're, you're doing highly controlled idealistic uh, uh, experiments, right? You just need a couple million dollars, you find two yeah. villages, and you run randomized control trials. Uh, but what happens many years after the intervention, you don't really know. Uh, is, the, the, is the impact sustainable? You don't really know. And even if you can prove that there is some kind of improvement, uh, it seems that so much of academia is about identification, finding some causality, publishing papers, uh, and, and whether this uh, really relates to the political economy of the country, whether, whether it suits the political purposes or agenda, or whether it is realistic to adopt that policy. It is not of the economist's concerns. They're there to make theoretical uh, improvement. So I'd love to hear your yes. thoughts on that. But I guess the other side would be, be saying, what do you mean? I mean, that's what e economists are supposed to do. They're supposed to uh, push for theoretical arguments and think about these things and not have to worry about normative questions and whether their policies mm -hmm. can be adopted by this uh, current regime and so on. So I, I, I wanted to hear your thoughts on, on, on this debate. Yeah, I've got a number of thoughts, one of which reminds me when I was a graduate student at Princeton, the Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton was run by an economist named Albert Hirschman. And uh, I would encourage people to read his biography by the Princeton historian Jeremy Edelman, because Hirschman was the kind of guy that when he talked to me, I was a young guy wondering if I wanted to stay and do all this formalism. And he said, well, you know, you've got a lot of training in math. You ought to stick it out past your generals and you can take history courses and stuff. But he said, I've always felt that an economist every five years should go out into the world to reconfigure what is important. In other words, what should be studied, what matters 
you don't get from the inward rituals and the fashion shows and the preferences of the peer review journals. You get that from talking to business people, policymakers, understanding where suffering is and trying to understand with your toolkit how to address those real challenges. So I think, I think that Edelman's uh, book gives you that sense of Hirschman, what I'll call the inductive inspiration as to what your research agenda should be that makes a meaningful contribution to society. And that staying inside, metaphorically, the monastery, dealing with your peers, being completely obsessed with the technique, the elegance, the beauty of a mathematical representation. And there's nothing wrong with being a great mathematician. It's like mastering a language. But it, it, uh, if it's done at the expense of using the tools for some purpose, it invites that skepticism. Early on, I, well, before the pandemic, I travel around the world a lot. INET is not an American institution in many ways. We've got outposts in India, relationships in China, all over Europe and what have you. And I remember being in China one time at Tsinghua University for a lunch during a conference. And some of the scholars said to me, you know the most frustrating thing about our profession? I said, what's that? He said, when we go to the top five peer review journals, which everybody tells us we have to do to get tenure here in China, we put out a paper that's an empirical paper based on what's happening in China, because we think the world's interested in China. And I said, well, it is. He said, yes, but they say that the referees are all in roughly North America or London, and the referees don't have confidence that they understand Chinese data. So they want us to take the paper with the same con concept and apply it to American data, and then they'll publish it. And these guys, these yeah. guys were, they were tearing their hair out. They were like, <laughs> wait a minute, no, people are interested in China. China's like this big new mystery coming on stage in the world economy. That should be published. And uh, but it, so there, there were lots of interesting stories as I explored uh, what you might call the basis for INET and then the how does INET help or make an impact early on. And I don't know how you match elegance, rigor, and relevance to satisfy everybody. All three have a, a dimension of luster. But if you leave out relevance, then as you say, the practitioners, the policy makers, and the citizens are gonna wonder what you're doing in giving this profession any kind of prestige or license over the governance or the system structure of society. I, I guess one other thing I would uh, quickly add on to that, uh, I mean, speaking of the economics profession, uh, perhaps you're a little bit more distant from, from this, but uh, at my age, when, when students think about getting a PhD, everybody is talking about this new trend called uh, pre-doctoral fellowships, pre-doctoral research assistants, pre-doc. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you do two years of RA research for a professor, and then they'll write mm -hmm. you a recommendation letter so that you can get into a PhD program, which means yes. nowadays you would do two years of that plus six years of PhD, which is eight years. It's a very, very long commitment. Oh, you meant, this... you, you know, you didn't mean doing it like, like I did riding shotgun. I worked for Morris Edelman and Kindleberger while I was taking classes. You're talking about as a full time. No, it's a full time thing. job. Wow. Wow. Uh, okay. I, I, I don't know if you know that. I mean, I mean, uh, it started with Raj Chetty. I mean, he, he's the guy who kind of made, made this very funny because it was really funny. I was telling my friends, they were saying that Raj Chetty is like showing up at the, all the conferences with like. Uh, three, five publications every year, and everybody is like, "What is what is he doing?" I mean, obviously, Raj Chetty is like uh, the, the 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 best applied good. macroeconomist of our time. Yeah, yeah. but but also he has uh, twelve pre docs. <laughs> in, yeah. in some, he has a yeah. big lab. He's built and, and, a machine. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and people say uh, these labs are almost like investment banks. I mean, not literally, but in some sense, it's that you you go in there for for two years. Uh, they train you into doing data work and you crunch data every day for two years. 
-hmm. and eventually you'll c come out getting into a much better uh, PhD program than you otherwise would because uh, you are you have a recommendation letter from a yeah. famous professor, yeah. Yeah. and 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 these days it has almost become somewhat of a prerequisite, and, and there are European students who would do their masters in Europe. And then come to the U.S. to do another pre-doc before applying to PhD wow. programs. So you see wow. all those 25-year-olds, 26-year-olds, you know, uh, starting their PhD because they did like two masters and two pre-docs. Yeah. And, when and, I, and the when I was a graduate yeah. student, what a lot of folks did was they went to London. They went to places like LSE and UCL, and they did a master's. And then they yeah. came in. And it, and it was almost like for the first year or so, they were on cruise control because they'd already taken the equivalent of general yes. exams. And they would make money as teaching and research assistants and then be ready to go in year three. Some yes. of them finished in the third year with their dissertation because they, they were on the, uh, how I say, skill development ahead of the curve yeah. where they could do that. But I hadn't, I hadn't heard about the, 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 the pre-doc. This is kind of the... The, the new big buzz that everybody, every school, every professor is, is hiring this thing. And, and I was talking to uh, Professor Bill Janeway, who is a yes. co-founder of, of, and I had forgotten to mention that he was uh, one of the first people I interviewed for my own podcast two years ago. So it, I, I'm very He's indebted to I him. He's on the He's a donor to it, it, yeah. Yeah. Yes, I, I've been watching his, uh, his videos on, on venture capitalism and public-private partnership. But yeah, uh, yes, so, so he, he was telling me, I said, you had a PhD, but then... You had a PhD and then you went to uh, investment banking and, and private equity to, be, to do finance. How is that? And he said, I got my PhD in three years. <laughs> and I said, if I were to get a PhD this year, uh, I would need eight, uh, eight years, basically, of my life. And, and, mm -hmm. and now I, I think that basically delays the profession. I mean, this is a hu huge debate within the economics professions these days, whether it is fair to treat these uh, undergrads uh, and, and whether doing this pre-doc thing is good for them. Because the pro side is saying you, you gain two years of skills, you think about research questions, and you get to work with a professor very closely for two years. The downside side is, um, especially the theorists who don't use a lot of those pre-docs, they, they really hate this because they say you, you push your back for two years and you're, yeah. you're grinding those data. You, if you get your PhD in eight years, is that really worth it? So, so I guess my, my question to you would be, um, what, what do you see as the, as the necessity of, of an economics PhD because you got the economics PhD, but you ended up going, you did not end up going to academia. So did you no, no, feel I, like, I mean, it, it, these days it's, it's not worth it to, to do this? Well, I think um, different people are wired different ways. And I just got to the place where I, I had a lovely experience. Alan Blinder, Bill Branson, Joe Stiglitz, Avinash Dixit, all kinds of very interesting people. Uh, lots of Lester Chandler, Bill, William Baumol. Uh, but I just didn't sense, and, and I had a lot of confidence in mathematics, having gone to MIT and studied a lot of aspects related to sailing and naval architecture and whatever prior to that. But I just, I didn't feel like my sense of purpose was going to be fulfilled in, in academia. In, in, in academia, I really, I just didn't push in that direction. Uh, and I guess uh, maybe, maybe I was a little bit influenced by my father. He had been an all-American swimmer at University of Michigan, kind of a superstar, went to their medical school was a professor publishing everywhere and he followed in the footsteps of his father and he left academia. He became what's called a clinical professor of urology in Detroit at Wayne State University, not at Michigan, which was like, you know, in the hall of fame of medical schools and built a private practice. And I asked him, why did you leave academia, dad? when I was in the middle of my PhD program, he said, the smaller the stakes, the bigger the fight. It's just not a sociology you want to live in. And I, yes. I, you know, you can laugh, that's a funny kind of thing, but his, yes. his sensibility was that there's all kinds of competition and petty infighting. What are you enduring emotionally and what are you trying to do? And 
I think combination of that and uh, there was a professor at Princeton in those days who's no longer with us, uh, Peter Kennan. He and I used to talk at great length about issues in international finance. He and I and Paul Volcker went fishing together and Volcker inspired me to come to the Fed and do my dissertation fellowship there and then helped me get a job on Capitol Hill where I had to do things like learn how to write speeches, uh, you know, different techniques. And I just was captivated by learning the learning process of understanding the institutions of politics and markets and what have you. And uh, so maybe to use the Albert Hirschman analogy, the inductive inspiration and curiosity captured my attention. And uh, I, I didn't I probably think I had the imaginative gifts of someone like Joe Stiglitz, who <laughs> very few people do, but at the time he was my teacher. I knew him and Sanford Grossman and a handful of people that were just putting out theoretical papers over and over and over that were always at the cutting edge and the frontier. And I admired them greatly, but I didn't think that was my calling, if you will. It was more an intuitive thing. Uh, uh, Mr. Johnson, you were saying how uh, the, 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 sen the incentive, I mean, sorry, the, the pie was so small so that, such that the, the fight was really big. And I wanted to ask you if, you if you think academia would really need to reform dramatically in order to change the culture or retain more talents. Because in some way, you could say finance is not really a zero-sum game because it's not sure some people get burned in, in the trades, but overall, if you're good, you can make money. You generating alpha does not really prevent another fund manager from generating alpha. But mm -hmm. in academia, there's only a certain limited amount of job posts, uh, uh, journal entries, mm -hmm. uh, and, and you know every top school hires three people a year. So, so it seems that the pie, you cannot actually grow the pie. Uh, mm -hmm. Almost in mm -hmm. some way, it's like it's like Bitcoin or gold, yeah. <laughs> limited uh, in supply. <laughs> well, you're, you're right. The, the, the uh, well, the demand for scholars is limited. Where you can grow the pies in the quality of what you do, and if you think you can make a market difference and be rewarded for it and be satisfied by it, uh, and that has to do with the tastes of the profession, what they. Uh, would ask you to do what they would honor as truly creative. When I was in graduate school, not man who's a professor at Princeton, Dilip Babu was a brilliant game theorist. He and David Pierce were both graduate students my year or the year ahead of me. And their, their gifts in expressing game theoretic puzzles or, or <coughs> problems in the different ways of resolving was was extraordinary and they were quickly picked up by elite institutions princeton had a reputation in the realm of game theory and high theory and uh, they were they were in their element and so uh, i guess for me coming out of that kindleberger realm he was a man who'd worked at the new york fed worked with the Marshall Plan, the intelligence community, had an institutionally inspired sense of economics and what was important, engaged in economic history. And I think, you know, economic history is fascinating because what it really is is multidisciplinary open season around particular episodes. Hopefully with things like data and economic tools, you can shed light on things. But it's much less constrained than working in the theoretical framework. And you know, modern people who've got a historical background, people like Adam Tooze at Columbia and others are able to express a great deal uh, that's germane to now by using historical analogies. And uh, you're right when we've talked in the past about being wary of how people use history to justify what they want you to believe now that it, 
how good a fit is the historical precedent for the challenge before us is always an open question. But I, in my own sensibility, which has got a lot more humanities and music and what I'll call right brain element, I didn't think I was in my element by trying to be a, a stellar economic theorist. And I didn't think I had the gifts that Dillip or David Pierce or others had in that, in that realm, which was what you might call at the core of the fashion of the time. I, I guess, how do you see as some of the uh, urge, either urgent challenges of academia, but also what they're generating these days? Because we know that uh, asi setting aside economics and social sciences, just, mm -hmm. just in general in society, a lot of people, especially if you're wondering what, what students like to talk about these days, uh, students really like to use the word postmodernism. Everybody's using this word these days, which is saying in a postmodern society, uh, mm -hmm. truths don't matter as much, values are not seen as important, uh, rules and norms used to be more set in stone, and now everything is yeah. ex existentialism, everybody has to create their own narratives, and, and blah, yeah. blah, blah. And, it's all and, relative, and, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and one of the, the thoughts I, w I wanted to bring up and also ask your thoughts on is that whether you think academia today, I guess not just limited to, to economics, but also other humanities and philosophy and so on, whether academia is more destructive than generative today. Be because there are intellectual historians who are saying that pre-modernism was about creating all those blocks on top of each other, whereas postmodern is more like melting away all the blocks. And that's why many feel that the second order consequences of all kinds of movements these days are not very well understood and they're very destructive because it makes people feel victimhood and so on and, and other even people like Thomas Sowell um, in, in economics have made these arguments and, and people are unsatisfied with the kind of research uh, that, that we're seeing. So rather than imagining new ways of economic policy or, or whatever, uh, it, it seemed to be a lot of questioning uh, of the previous, maybe, maybe not in economics per se, but, but it seems that in other disciplines a lot of people are saying that. So, so I wanted to hear your thoughts on whether you, you see us being in a, in a cultural slash social slash uh, academic recession in, in, in some way, where, where people wake up in the morning and they're more interested in, in owning the libs or, or something rather than creating in something. They're, they're creating consuming culture, but, but, but we're not, not really doing that. We're not creating. Yeah. Well, I do think that all of the breakdowns associated with postmodernism at one level has been constructive in that false confidence gets replaced by a certain humility when the arbitrariness, what I will call the presuppositions, are exposed as being that and not science. You know, you can create a nice array of things with normative implications and call it science unless the presuppositions which are building blocks, arbitrary, sometimes making it, quote, mathematically tractable, have a huge influence on your result, in which case you're not proving anything, you're asserting something. So I think some of the postmodern uh, challenges restored some humility. On the other side, and we've talked about a little bit about the uh, commodification of social design, when what people assert is truth is essentially marketing for power. And the power system is creating a tremendous amount of suffering. And in the case of climate change, a tremendous amount of danger. Then the people who are engaged in these rituals, these intellectual jousts, are fiddling while Rome burns and that there is an enormous need for courageous people who understand what's going wrong. And there's an even deeper need for understanding the psychology of healing. The book I most often cite in podcasts now was written by a man named John W. Gardner, who was a Republican 
Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare in the 1960s in the Lyndon Johnson, which was a Democratic administration, who presided during the time of the riots in Watts and Detroit and Newark and other places. He presided at the time when Martin Luther King was murdered. He presided and observed as a former cabinet official as the Black Panthers rose up, as the 68 conventions, particularly in Chicago, exhibited violence and as people were terrified of a disintegration. And I would encourage everyone to read his book called The Recovery of Confidence because it's about needing dissent and needing purpose at the same time. And when you talk about the questions of uh, postmodern rivalries and debates and so forth, it feels like the dissent is present, but the purpose hasn't been defined. Technique, knowledge, and wisdom are different parts of the human spirit. And I think that many of the people screaming at these academic food fights, metaphorically, are saying, you're not focused on the important questions and you're not exercising wisdom and you're not healing society and perhaps you're not free to do so. I know people who study universities. Jerry Heron at Wayne State in Detroit uh, wrote a book in the 1980s called The University and the Myth of Cultural Decline, which was the power reaction against uh, what I'll call left-wing human humanitarian or humanist uh, liberal arts educators. There was a famous document called the Powell Memo by a man named Lewis Powell. He wrote it as a memo for the Chamber of Commerce and he later became a Supreme Court Justice saying, why are we letting the anti-war movement and people like Ralph Nader and the hippies and these left-wing intellectuals have so much influence over the design and structure of our society? In this chaotic period, we need to exercise the strength and the power of corporations and the sense of purpose and the, and the not demonization, but the actual affirmation of the importance of business. And he, he created a rallying cry for a profound change in the incentives around the university. And I don't know if perhaps now, 40 years after that time, maybe a little bit long, 50 years after, I think it's 49, 50 years since the Paul memo was written, whether the pendulum has gone too far in the other direction. There are a whole lot of people that joust to demonstrate their intellectual acumen, and they only pick fights that won't offend powerful people because they don't want to get caught in the crossfire. So I don't know how we deal with important questions that do affect concentrations of power and exercise wisdom and a recovery of confidence unless courage is, is part of it. But clearly the kind of wrestling matches that you're talking about are not sufficient for intellectual yeah. to, to play a, a wholesome yeah. and important role. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Johnson, it, it really fascinates me that um, you didn't use the word uh, truth in, in, in what you were saying. You were t talking about return to this kind of dialogue or whatever. And, and uh, a lot of thought leaders these days and, and public intellectuals, uh, they, they often cite misinformation as a big threat to our society and mm -hmm. they cite the deviation from facts and truth as a, as a huge um, yeah. reason why we're in the shape we are today. Because, I mean, going back to your very first question about yes. Rome being on fire, and, and I wanted to hear your thoughts on, on truth because it seemed to me okay. that, 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 that truth... Uh, I'm not sure if truth matter as much as we make them to be in, in the sense that humans okay. are not naturally truth seeking. We, we're, um, we're more driven by our narratives 
and, and narrative is, is, is a word that you used in our previous discussion. Yeah. And it, it's not just the stock markets and Bitcoins that are being driven by narratives right now, rather than mm -hmm. fundamentals, but rather, uh, you know, you, you all know Harari wrote, wrote this in Sapiens, and his whole theory is that humans are fundamentally organized by uh, narratives. So, so, uh, so I, I wanted to ask your thoughts on this statement, because it, it seems that mm -hmm. it's, there's no point to try to get back to the truth, because truths don't really ex exist per se, but, but it should be that we need to get better, to get back to better narratives, meaning yeah. back, in, back in the post-World War yeah. II period, it used to be patriotism, that, that was the main narrative. And today it was nationalism, today it's tribalism, that, that's the main narrative that's, that's driving the division. So it seems, that w it seems that we just need to create a better set of narratives, right? Well, I think the yearning for that notion called truth is a reflection of what my friend Vincent Kendrick in Denmark wrote about in his book, Infowars. And it's, it's about the... <laughs> Yeah. of inability of people to uh, experience credible guidance, trust in the people who are making the arguments, et cetera. And that, and that yearning is understandable. On the other hand, I can take uh, from the turbulence between two world wars of the author E.H. Carr, who, uh, wrote a wonderful book called The 20 Years Crisis. But the book I'm quoting from is called What is History? And he said, facts are like sacks. If you don't put something in them, they don't stand up. And the idea that truth is something that is there as opposed to something that is there in conjunction with the interpretation is, I think, uh, a false innocence. I think that the facts you collect, there's a poet that I quote frequently named by NQ is his stage name, NQ for in question. And he's got a poem called Evidence. And in the poem, he says, people will find evidence to support what they want to believe. So is that truth? Is that the whole truth? Is that a subset of the truth? Even if the subset of that evidence is accurate. If it's not associated with the evidence you didn't cultivate, it may be misleading. So trying to understand what truth means is a very subtle and difficult thing. And I understand the yearning for the ideal given the chaos that's before us, but I don't think it's, like I said, I don't think it's achievable without the role of interpretation. And that brings you back to narrative and everything else as the partner with truth. At some level, what we want are high integrity, trustworthy scholars who marshal evidence and paint pictures for us of what the challenge appears to be and how they would resolve it. But the techniques of partial truth, of what Vincent Kendrick calls info wars, are quite effective. And at some level, we need to, I think, deepen our awareness of mind science to understand the regions of the brain and what affects your perception of truth, how you might be given comfort rather than truth by a certain stimulant and that the comfort that you experience overrides your ability to discriminate between truth and falsehood. But, but, it, but I, these are very, very interesting questions that you're asking. But, but truth, truth is not quite so easy. I remember John Lennon singing the song, just give me some truth. And I remember one of my friends who used to uh, know and work around the Beatles and some of the Beatles. He said, he used to say, give me some truth. He'd sing it on stage. And then after the concert, he'd mutter things like, I just wish I knew what truth was. And I guess 
I guess that's where I, I think I think John Lennon's intuition is pretty close to where I sit. Yes. Wow. Um, do do you think we have made progress as humans? I think we've made digress <laughs> in the last ten years. <laughs> I think we've gone backwards, and I think some of the uh, end of things with the media had a, there was a law called the fairness doctrine the polarization yeah. in politics and other things, the knowledge of how repetition and in an online sense, you're not dealing with someone you know face to face that you've got to deal with day after day. You're being bombarded by hundreds of people who you only know electronically. How you process that signal to noise ratio and discern what you believe is true is a very different process now. When you're with a human being, there's all kinds of elements of nonverbal communication. What poker players call a tell, you're watching the body language of the individual to try to discern when you're playing poker whether they're bluffing or whether they're holding a strong hand of cards and they study each other. There's a psychologist woman from Russia who went to Harvard named Maria Konnikova, she writes for the New Yorker, who's written a lot about this subject. And I think, I think her nuance, she's someone I would go to with that, that question that you asked me, and she'd do a better job of answering it than I can. I see, I see. Um, another thing that I wanted to hear your thoughts on is uh, you worked with George Soros, and we, at the beginning of our interview, we, we talked about uncertainty. Yes. No, n not knowing the unknowns of the unknowns, basically. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, and and uh, I, I wanted to hear your thoughts on all the recent trends in finance that, that we're seeing. I mean, not just the GameStop saga, not just the rise of Bitcoin, not just that the stock market has become more yeah. detached from fundamentals, but also the fact that we seem to be in another irrational exuberance, huge boom, that uh, a lot of people say there is no way we don't crash uh, mm -hmm. eventually mm -hmm. because you, you, it is simply supported by Federal Reserve policies, liquidity, easy money, cheap capital, low interest rate. None of this is sustainable. But on the other hand, it also seems that people have such a doubt on the expert class for getting us out of this horrible situation. This new, it seems that this has to be the new normal. And this new normal has to continue for a long time. So you would be a fool to think that this will crash. Stock well, markets I, I, only go up. Yeah. <laughs> I would encourage people to look at George's book, The Alchemy of Finance, because there's no sense in which you can say everything follows some kind of deterministic equilibrium. But you have to have a hypothesis about what's going to change that brings the market down and the timing of when. You know, I had a lot of friends who were short sellers when I worked in the hedge fund business that worked with other firms, but they were my acquaintances. Uh, Jim Chanos, who's quite famous and was involved in the Enron episode of unmasking Enron's uh, fraudulent positions through some of their special purpose vehicles. And people like Jim and others in that realm used to say to me, it's really dangerous to short a technological innovation that has no earnings because there's no way you can disprove that hypothesis. And as long as people have that subjective psychological conviction, the price isn't going to come down. You take something like the steel industry and you say, we can look at 100 years of data on the steel industry and the P.E. ratio goes from 5 to 23. And if it's at 28 now, you think the pendulum's rocked way over to one side and it'll probably mean revert and it's dangerous to be there. Well, looking at the circumstance right now, and I'm not an active speculator, so I don't want to pretend from my past that I know I have any particular insights. 
But I don't see interest rates coming back up until the real economy comes back up. And the real economy will either come back up through fiscal spending on real projects like energy transformation and a rise in wages and perhaps a rise in wages in the lower two thirds of society where the propensity to consume out of every dollar earned is much higher. So therefore potentially a redistribution of wealth and income to a more level place would create a more resilient and stronger aggregate demand, which would allow interest rates to go back up. And so then you might say interest sensitive sectors are going to get hurt. Other sectors are going to do well. And the Fed will follow that because there won't be an inflation danger until that aggregate demand strength is there. And so we might wallow, continue to wallow in this low interest rate environment for a very long time. But I, to go back to the Soros question, what's the catalyst for busting what people are calling a bubble? If you say to it, me, they're going to they're, they're <laughs> stay with accommodative monetary finance for the next day, next decade, excuse me, then you're not going to want to get off the train especially when bond yields are like one and a half percent. Yes, uh, which is well, already seen as too high these days. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, so I don't know. I, 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 your question is a good one. I'm not in the cockpit. You'd do much better to get my former colleague, Stanley Druckenmiller or yeah. Lewis Bacon <laughs> or others to be on your podcast and explore these issues. But, uh, uh, yes. but, but, I, but I do think uh, that notion that Soros has. We don't know the future. And you got to tell me what you know that the rest of the world doesn't and when they're going to find out. So it will catalyze a change in their perceptions, which sends the market down. And I don't have that hypothesis and I'm not studying it closely enough to to give you. Yeah. One. But that's the process I would have followed had I still been in the businesses. It's very hard to do hypothesis testing, especially when, when the distribution, underlying distribution is shifting, as you said. Yeah. When, when you do not know what the actual probability distribution is, per se. So, yep. so yeah. This is the radical uncertainty. You can um, be right about the outcome, but, but you can be wrong. What is yeah. the old saying John Maynard Keynes said? The market can stay wrong longer than you can stay solvent. Then you can solvent, exactly. And, uh, uh, which is why short sellers get burned all the time because yeah. they may be right eventually, but they couldn't stay solvent. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so, so that, that is it. Okay. Um, I, I, I don't have too, too many concluding uh, questions. I, I, I still have questions on my mind. I don't know where, where you, you hope to, to take this, Mr. Johnson. I mean, we can, uh, we, we can talk a little bit more. I mean, I would love sure. to. Sure. Uh, whatever, whatever is on your mind, I'm happy to talk about. <laughs> And I was also wondering if you have more questions for me. So, so I was. Uh, no, I, I think way. I, uh, I kind of I covered most of the bases that I had too. I yeah. mean, I, I have a thoughts in conclusion after exploring with you, but but for the moment, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm how would I say? Uh, I'm I'm curious what you think your audience would be interested in about INET and and yes. the world. Um, th th there is, um, I mean, it's, it seems that INET is somewhat connected with Silicon Valley in, in some way. I mean, you, you mentioned Pia Manani is, is uh, leading an operation in San Francisco. You guys certainly do uh, very interesting research related to tech innovations and productivity and, and so mm -hmm. on. So I, I guess there's a very gen general question about whether you see Silicon Valley, like what values you see Silicon Valley is contributing to society right now. What, whether we are in a great technological stagnation that some people would say. Whereas mm -hmm. uh, Eric Weinstein would say we, we are, uh, we've been uh, innovating so much in bits and not the quantum. Or, or, <laughs> mm. um, yeah. Well, well, I think first of all, um, there's a, I see a tide raising 
uh, I'll quote my friend and professional colleague, Rohinton Medora, who runs the Center for International Governance Innovation, has been a partner with INET uh, through his founder, Jim Balsilli, being one of our founding donors. And Rohinton asked a question. We were at a meeting at the Vatican last, just before the pandemic, last February, with Pope Francis and his team. And Rohinton, I'm paraphrasing, said essentially, why do we have a food and drug administration where you trial the drugs, you make sure they're safe before you put them out there, but with large scale social transformation of technology, they go out there and they can do good or they can do damage, but we don't test them, evaluate them or pre-authorize them. I think there are a lot of people who are frightened right now of the, what am I call natural monopoly, the increasing return structure, which creates tremendous concentrations of power in the governance of information and perceptions by people like Google and Facebook. And so there is a lot of movement afoot. INET has produced some research reports on antitrust enforcement. There's a lot of concern about the relationship between the service they provide, say Facebook connecting you with all your high school friends and the data they collect, which can be used for marketing or intelligence and espionage without you knowing. And I think that we we're in the middle right now of exploring what I what Rohinton might have called the social ramifications of these successful market structures. And are they doing good or harm? We mentioned earlier in this conversation the social dilemma, the quality of the information environment, the quality of democracy, the ability to separate commerce from cybersecurity in the multilateral relationship between the United States and China, the ability to monitor hacking. All of these things have very, very profound social implications. And I think we're still at the infancy of trying to understand how to harness them for social purpose. In a place like the United States where the, what I'll call fetish of individual rights and freedom meaning the freedom to do what you want, but doesn't include the freedom from it being done to you by others. We have to re-envision what is the balance and what are the ramifications. I think the displacement of work associated with automation and machine learning has productive potential, but the history of the United States, say since 1970, is not inspiring in what you might call the adjustment assistance for people and regions and professions who are being displaced by innovations and some of the social despair and discord that we've talked about in this conversation are now on a, a scale and a breadth that is quite daunting. It is part of the rage and the despair that we are grappling with. So I do think that the, what you might call deeper questions of what is the purpose of a society and how can technology be channeled, shaped, governed to be aligned with that sense of purpose is a very important mission in the coming decades. And the capacity of governance to actually understand. When I go to the seminars that we hold in the Presidio at Pia's gatherings for INET, it's fascinating for me to learn how much these people from Silicon Valley around the table understand about the structures and what they're doing relative to the people in Washington. So to govern something, in other words, you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. You got to be able to understand what the good of it is 
and what the bad of it is that needs to be restrained. That involves understanding the technology and understanding having a vision or a metric of what social purpose is so you can align the technology with social purpose. And I don't think that at this juncture, we have matured in ways that allow that. And to say whatever a tech entrepreneur wants, wants to do, they can do because of individual freedom is an Ayn Randian kind of fantasy. Which and, and I guess, I guess not, yeah. Please. I mean, at the other end of the pendulum is authoritarian control of everything and stifling of innovation that could be helpful or people fighting over intellectual property rights. And so the better thing can't be discovered using litigation to intimidate people so that you can take them over at half the price of what their innovation is worth. If you've got deep pockets, there are all kinds of things happening in that realm that are very, very profound potentially on the quality of life. And I think we have to, we, we have to understand that on the plus side, I'm very, uh, curious about removing what you might call the barriers to education. I went to MIT. I understand that the electrical engineering curriculum that I experienced is available online for certification all throughout India. That may have some very powerful equilibrating uh, alleviation of poverty, creating knowledge intensive human capital in places that couldn't afford to pay the tuition. So I think there, I think there's, it's not all good or all evil, but to me, it feels like as a society, we have to redefine what we want. And it's almost childish to just focus on individual rights in light of the lessons we're learning. And we have to understand the ramifications of these innovations, and we need to channel them in constructive direction. It's really interesting that you brought up the people can learn how to code ex example, because uh, uh, right, right now, you, you can just get cert certified by Google by, by going through their, their courses, and you can get a job there or something that, that, that is equivalent as a college degree in, in computer science or, or data science, sorry. Yeah. And, and so I guess, does that mean, this is kind of going back to the very beginning of our conversation, which is the discussion on Michael Sandel and the uh, tyranny of meritocracy in, in mm -hmm. some way. So uh, does that mean um, credentialism will be increasingly uh, more obsolete as, as we democratize this thing? So, so in other words, what is the point of having another Princeton? It seems that uh, the, the only solution out of this current elite thought bubble of, of Princeton or whatever is that you either uh, significant reform where you simply democratize this to such an extent that the elites no longer exist. Mm -hmm. Well, as you know, both Steve Jobs and Bill Gates did not finish college, and they yeah. did okay. Yeah. I think yeah. if you're talking about what you might call vocational tools, that's a different thing than what you might call building the soul of society. There is what I would refer to as a humanities arts, civics, meaning understanding the institutions of society and their ramification, philosophy and other things that should nurture the curiosity of most every citizen. Probably should start in high school or junior high school. I have a daughter right now in sixth grade who's reading the Iliad and the Odyssey and writing poetry about it and she's a very gifted student, but the, uh, I think those parts of what I'll call soul development are very important. I think the vocational skills, which are related to the credentials and the career development and the economic security that one might achieve are a different category. And I don't know quite how to organize education so that all of these things are, are what you might call at 
in proper levels brought to bear for the young people of tomorrow. Mr. Johnson, there's simply too many other themes we can dive into, but perhaps I, I should uh, consciously, gradually uh, wrap up with, with one last big, big theme I wanted to hear your thoughts on, which is the future of capitalism in, in some way. Because there, uh, you mentioned this Irandian view of Silicon Valley, which a lot of people say is the, the, you know, this yeah. uh, Schumpeterian creative destruction uh, view of Silicon Valley. You leave them alone, yeah. let them create values, and if they can sell a software, that's adding value to society. That kind of view... Uh, you don't seem to think that that's the future of capital. Certainly not the future of capital. Well, I, I think there's a balance here. Uh, I do not think that Silicon Valley sprung up out of the imagination of a handful of entrepreneurs. I think it was guided by DARPA and the NSA and the military industrial complex just and has many side effects that weren't related to the initial agenda that those gifted entrepreneurs and so forth imagined and are now developing and implementing. I think the space program had many side effects. So I guess what I'm saying is I think there's a role for the state as a catalyst. It's not a pure free market individual phenomena. That's a fantasy. Watch Adam Curtis's documentary. Was it all, all wrapped up or all caught up in machines of loving grace. And it's about the libertarian fantasy that kind of took 60s counterculture and whole earth catalog marketing materials to this notion of freedom of technology. But I think that the, uh, the, the sense of the future of capitalism is will, whatever the structure, the state, the private sector, how assets and other things are taxed or not, whether the nation state can protect you or whether in a global system, there's enough sensitivity at the level of global governance to take care of concerns. I think these are all very, very stressful dilemmas to consider. They're stressful because I don't see any easy answers. I do think that there's a lot of, which I might call unintended benefit in some creative destruction. But I think if it's unbridled and facilitates a tremendous concentration of wealth, income, and therefore political power, it can times do more harm than good. I think we will see, if we succeed, the state playing a very substantial role in energy transformation so that we meet the climate change before an ungodly emergency overwhelms society. I think the state will have to play a role, just as, let, uh, being silly, if the Martians attacked us, we would have to have a war preparation vis-a-vis -vis the UFOs. In World War II, we had war preparation led by administrations. Seth Klein, Naomi Klein's older brother, has written a book called The Good War, about the analogy between war preparation by the Canadians who joined World War II before the United States, a couple of years before, and the need for the country of Canada organize itself for energy transformation because they are a big fossil fuel producer. So they have both demand and supply side challenges. So I, th I think uh, people like Mariana Mazzucato and Bill Janeway are contemplating these interactions. And that has something to do with the viability of the system and the potential for what we might call a mixed capitalism to succeed. But I think at the end of the day, the, the one thing I would say, and this comes from my work at the Union Theological Seminary, markets and capitalism are a tool, not a deity. They are a means to an end. 
in service of society when used appropriately and to deify them allows their abuses to unfurl to a degree that should never be tolerated. But to allow an ideologue to stifle them in authoritarian control is also dangerous. We will need very sophisticated leaders to strike the balance between those two pressures. Which, which is saying that the market is not the society and, and, and market value is often very different from societal and social value. Uh, and, we, and we have yes. to be mindful of that. And, and, and when markets and capitalism are embedded uh, within a functioning political system and society and democracy, right. it would do yes. a lot of good. And, and if broken, right. it could do a lot of harm. I would yeah. encourage you uh, to have your listeners and my listeners go to the uh, BBC website and listen to my friend Mark Carney, the former governor of the Bank of England's wreath lectures of this year. And the first of, there's one on uh, COVID, there's one on climate. He's working with the UN as a special emissary on climate. Uh, and there's, but the first one is, I think the title is Market Economy versus Market Society. The market economy works as a tool embedded in something that has values that govern it. A market society is where market values become the value structure. And it's an inversion between means and ends. But Mark, Mark is very deeply studied going back to Adam Smith, David Hume and others through, you know, Ricardo and John Stuart Mill and up to the present. In that 55 minutes, you can learn a lot. And uh, yeah. I'd encourage you to, to explore his thinking Absolutely. right now. Uh, to, to kind of conclude, what, what would be one contrarian thought that you hold that uh, many people around you, even at INET, or, or many of your intellectual peers do not agree with? I think at INET, there's a great deal of focus on this question of the inseparability between politics and economics. And what I've said in this conversation is the commodification of social design. The moral legitimacy of capitalism is being embedded in a democracy. And when it captures governance and can buy policies. For instance, when the financial sector through its campaign contributions can have itself deregulated, maintain budget austerity so that when you need a bailout, you have contingent fiscal capacity at your disposal. You're allowing that sector to subsidize itself at the expense of the public. That's just a hypothetical that it's not, I don't think it's entirely hypothetical, but I'm saying it's just an example. This pertains to many different sectors. If the fossil fuel industry is not brought to the social challenge, then we're in real trouble in terms of life on earth. And maybe a few people with a billion dollars of stranded assets can use that money to get on a spaceship with Elon Musk and go to Mars but the rest of us experience hell. So I think uh, it's that relationship between defining a moral social vision, debating it so that it's not dogmatic or authoritarian, and having the institutions that can guide society in that direction. I think about things often like how much civil servants get paid in America. Compared to Singapore, they're paid a pittance. They sometimes have to go to work for the people they regulated so their kids can go to college. That's not serving the American people. So I, I live in America, but I mean, the concerns are, are worldwide. But I think, I think the, if you said, to me, where, where are my concerns? Identifying social unsustainability, identifying financial fragility, 
identifying environmental challenges is one dimension, but that political economic nexus is where they will be solved or not solved. And uh, I think that's where a lot of despair arises now, because they don't see the system of governance and direction and formation of priorities as being wholesome, broad-based, or sustainable. So for the purpose of, of my show, which is Policy Punchline, we always ask our guests at the end what their punchline is. So I guess this, this will also go on your show, but I, 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 yeah, I okay. guess nobody has ever well, asked fine. you Let's go with what your, your punchline is. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll give you a punchline for your show first Please. and then my show. Yes. My, my, my punchline <laughs> is that the situation is daunting. It has to be diagnosed, but we can't afford despondency and despair, and hatred doesn't help. My punchline for you is that I'm inspired and more hopeful when I meet someone like you who has humility and curiosity and vitality. A bunch of people like you are the kind of thing, and I'm not saying they all have to go to Princeton. We've talked about that. But people with your spirit and your unyielding curiosity and your humility and your sense that something's got to happen is a blessing for us all. Thank you so much for those kind words, Mr. Mr. Johnson. You're, you're way too kind to, to to invite me on the on the show. I mean, this is uh, it, it's very fortunate that we got to meet each other a couple of years ago. I mean, I, I still I agree. remember. Uh, I I still remember first getting your email from uh, Jeffrey Schaefer, who who came on yes. my show, and he he's also on the on the board for Julius Rabinowitz Center, and he was yes. the deputy uh, secretary for treasury for for many years, and and uh, under. Uh, Bob Rubin and Larry Summers, I believe. And, That's right. And uh, he, uh, he was on my show, and I, I remember running into him, and he, he said, uh, Rob Johnson was looking for you, but, but he had to go back to New York. <laughs> and he gave me his, your, your, your email. And, and, oh, uh, and it's nice how, how, how things came. And then we had the, the very long chat uh, last year, last March, at, at our right. in-person annual conference. Uh, when, when you uh, really talked to me for, for 30 minutes at the reception about... Um, pe people's skepticism of academia and, and a lot of those issues, which I think back then I was still very naive to, uh, more naive than now, I'm still very naive today, but more naive than to comprehend a lot of your words, but right now I'm, I'm getting more out of, out of this uh, every time we, we talk. So uh, yeah. th thank you so much for, for, for having me, obviously. Yeah. Uh, thank you. We'll have to do this again. In a few we, we will have to, e exactly. Excellent. Uh,